Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, our executive director is on vacation this week, so there'll be no executive director's report. We're going to go immediately to the minutes of Wednesday, July 13th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, July 13th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing on all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the motion carried unanimously. And now we're going to turn to the uh, business of the day, which is uh, an initial uh, review of the hospital budgets for 2023. And I'm going to turn the meeting over to Sarah Lindberg. Sarah. Sarah, you're muted. You able to see my screen? Yes. That's great, and now you can hear me. So we're all we're all all ready. <laughs> Sarah Lindberg, uh, I'm the director of the finance team here at the Green Mountain Care Board, and today we're here to just give you a preliminary overview of the fiscal year 2023 hospital budget submissions, as we have seen them through July 20th. So as a refresher, uh, the process began when submissions came in on July 1st. Today we're going to give you this preliminary review. Hearings will be the weeks of August 15th and 22nd with deliberations starting September 1st and decisions finalized by September 15th and written orders due by October 1st. Uh, so we have not received any public comments to date, but there is currently a special public comment period uh, in order for the board to consider those comments. They need to be submitted prior to August 31st. So anyone interested in making a comment may use this link or find it on our website. You also may find on our website the individual hospital submissions as well as the documents uh, highlighting what we asked for for fiscal year 23. There also is a high level overview of the hospital budget review process available on our website. So just to kind of orient us in the bigger picture, uh, the state of Vermont is uh, working in its entirety to continue health reform goals. One major uh, recent addition was Act 167 of 2022. And some of the work in that uh, legislation that is relevant to hospital budget review is that it charges the Green Mountain Care Board with developing an allowable rate of growth for Vermont hospital budgets with a myriad of conditions to make sure that they are um, helping to sustain and support our hospitals. And we also are in collaboration with AHS working on developing value-based payments and promoting the long-term stability of our healthcare system. So that is uh, doing things uh, in order to uh, bring people together and think creatively about uh, the problems facing us all. Um, and just always helpful to rem remind ourselves what is in uh, the board's purview and what is outside of it. So the way that reimbursements to hospitals or any provider work um, is that Medicare establish is its rates through federal rule. There currently are some proposed rules for federal fiscal year 23 on the inpatient per perspective payment system in calendar year 23 for the outpatient prospective payment system and the physician fee schedule. Uh, these are proposed rules. They are no not finalized and there's actually quite a bit of um, uh, back and forth uh, requests that Medicare reconsider these proposed rates. Um, but right now where it stands is a 3.2% net uh, change in the IPS reimbursements, 2.7 in the OPS, and the physician fee schedule is expected to take a significant hit. Uh, a lot of that is due to uh, and the expiration of a COVID-related reimbursement increase of 3%. Um, there's additional strife about uh, some upcoming uh, statutorily required sequestration 
as part of the PAYGO Act, the Pay As You Go Act, um, which would add an additional 4% cut potentially to providers. So all that to say is that um, Medicare rates, um, uh, you know, are a source of stress on the system. Uh, the way that Medicaid reimbursement works is Medicaid, um, or I should say the Department of Vermont Health Access establishes the payment rates, but any changes to those rates must first go through approval of the state budget. So the legislature is the one who actually approves those. So um, any changes that would hit this fiscal year uh, would theoretically occur in the state fiscal year 24 budget which means that by the time those would kind of be on the table, it wouldn't be until Q4 of the hospital's fiscal year. Now there are um, wild times, call for wild measures. Uh, so last year, the Budget Adjustment Act did include a change that allowed rates to be effective January 1st, 2022. So that is um, certainly something that might be possible, but all of this, of course, is uh, the Department of Vermont Health Access and the state legislature, not something that Green Mountain Care Board directly influences. So uh, for commercial and self-funded plans, uh, essentially uh, the Green Mountain Care Board's decision-making here sets two different amounts of change that are allowable. One is for the overall net patient revenue and fixed perspective payments for a hospital. And the other is the um, requested change in charge. And that is, again, the charge associated with the services. Those are then uh, translated to negotiations between the hospitals and their different payers. So it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one increase. Um, and furthermore, Different groups have different plan years, so they they typically are from January 1st to December 31st, but uh, by no means is that universal. And so there's a little bit of lag in trying to get all these reimbursement changes to kind of marry up. So that's just one of the challenges that people face when they're trying to develop these budgets for us. So in terms of what is within our wheelhouse, uh, the guidance that was sub, uh, submitted to uh, the providers, to the hospitals who submitted their budgets, was that uh, the, the aggregate growth rate, so from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 24, the board was suggesting an aggregate growth rate of 8.6%. So there was not any idea about whether all 8.6 would be used in fiscal year 23 or any other guidance in addition to that. However, the board also said that they would consider other requests as long as there was support for that uh, request given within the submission. And the factors the board in the guidance established it would consider the hospital budget submissions based on is a long list, so bear with me while I read you a slide. <laughs> but the first is kind of typical financial metrics of a hospital, such as days cash on hand and other typically collected metrics and ratios. And that uh, assessment may include looking at year over year comparisons or benchmarking uh, that information with other hospitals. Um, we also said that uh, on the table for consideration would be growth of operating expenses and any offset by reduction uh, in conjunction with the NPR and FPP. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Uh, we also were able to consider hospitals other operating revenue in connection with their operating expenses, what the hospital's long-term strategic and financial plans are for sustainability, uh, data and information provided by insurers and other third-party administrators regarding actual and projected utilization and price changes, as well as the impacts on Vermonters and employers in the commercial market. And that includes our self-funded employers um, and our other payers, Medicare and Medicaid, and what payment changes might mean for them. <clears throat> we wanna look at how any payment changes um, are gonna work in confluence with these budgets. We highlighted some of those expected changes that we know to date already as well as any uh, guesses about what might happen to the rate of uninsured Vermonters. Uh, We're looking at previously approved changes in NPR and FPP. We are able to consider population or demographic data, and this lists some of the reports we currently have available, such as patient migration and the supplemental data that we provided related to the census information. 
Also looking at the variation in reimbursement data that we have based on both cost and cost coverage. Um, that's what I think of as kind of the analysis that Burns and Associates did for us last October. And then looking at data relative to payments to similar hospitals. So how in line do our hospitals seem? Um, and that includes trying to estimate uh, medical inflation. And then <clears throat> as dictated by law, we have to take into consideration the extraordinary labor costs and investments and the impact that has on the affordability of health care. And the catch all any other relevant factors proposed during the review process. So that is what we have on our menu for consideration this year. So to just tee up some high level themes in the budgets as we're reviewing them, um, first and foremost is there is a consistent concern about the financial health of our hospitals and they establish um, or put forward their concern about their ability to continue to provide necessary services. And so many of these budgets are um, directly framed as um, providing stability and trying to stabilize the system in order to be able to continue to provide that necessary care. Um, the main drivers of expense increases, which were substantial um, or are budgeted to be substantial, uh, has to do with that inflation. So the cost of supplies increasing and also labor and workforce more broadly is a major driver. So it's not just um, having to use more costly temporary labor like travelers and locums, but also some unbudgeted increases to salaries in order to attract and retain staff, um, which you know is an investment that theoretically would cut down on the um, higher investment for more temporary staff. Um, in addition to that, the even though we already knew travelers were expensive, during kind of this supply crunch, they were even more expensive in fiscal year 22 than anyone had ever seen before. So some um, issues related to operating revenue. Uh, so there are definitely continuing effects of COVID on our providers, and that is um, going from kind of delaying capital investments um, to having provider burnout, um, the toll that the mental health crisis is taking on staff is also acute, um, more violence in the workplace. So they're still kind of dealing with the aftermath of the pandemic and what it's put us all through, but um, with drastically less relief funding to help with some of those stressors. Um, also, the federal 340B program um, is continuing to show net declines to the system, so we're losing about $25 million over the fiscal year 22 budgets, and that has to do with um, pharmaceutical companies kind of pulling um, certain pharmaceuticals from participation in that program. Um, but we are also seeing an increasing revenue from specialty pharmacy, so that added $99 million to the other operating revenue in the budgeted fiscal year 23 uh, over fiscal year 22. Other themes, uh, changes in case mix, and there's a few different ones that have been um, showing up in the budget requests. One has to do with Medicare Advantage, uh, so that's affected us in a couple ways. One is that um, we want to work in the future to make sure that revenue is booked consistently in the same place. So I think it's um, sometimes appeared in commercial and now has moved over to Medicare. So we just wanna make sure we have that cleared up. Um, but also payment changes can often be lagged with the Medicare Advantage business. So that's just a kind of uh, factor that's shown up in some of the budgets. Uh, we are seeing you know, the continued effect of aging here in Vermont. So more people relatively being covered by Medicare than other payers. And then there is the anticipated um, re redeterminations once the public health emergency is over federally, which would affect the Medicaid um, caseload. And so uh, that's just a, another uncertainty facing the budget for 23. Uh, we are seeing a, a pretty consistent increase in ER and ED visits, as well as imaging, which might be an indicator that um, some of the care deferral that was true in the past may be subsiding. However, there does seem to be um, recurrence of that suppression of care whenever there's a surge. So if we do have another um, big bump in uh, COVID uh, this fall, uh, we might see expect to see that drop again. <clears throat> so here are the uh, rates uh, that I'm sorry. 
to be precise. These are the requested change in charges. So this is over the charge master, which is not uh, specific to any one payer, but that is, you know, the basis for the um, the amounts that uh, are billed and then uh, ne uh, negotiated discounts over those. So uh, you can see that there's quite a range uh, for fiscal year uh, 23, going as low as 3.65% uh, uh, with UVM's commercial effective rate of 19.9 .9 being the top. The weighted uh, increase here would be about 16% uh, change if we use the commercial rates for the UVM Health Network hospitals. So these are, you can see, higher than we've typically seen in previous years, um, but uh, we can kind of visualize that here. <laughs> so on slide 11, we can see uh, the range min and max of approved change in charges from fiscal year 17 to fiscal year 22. We can see that over this time period, um, the range of those uh, approved changes has been quite wide, um, but the median tends to be um, around 5% or less. So even if there's been a lot of variation, um, the median tends to be close to that. <clears throat> and if we look at what requested charges have looked like from 17 to 22, with an X marking the spot for what the request in 23 is, uh, we can see quite a few Xs far off to the right. Uh, so that's kind of evidence that these requests are higher than typical, um, but we also are seeing expenses that are higher than typical. So um, just to put that into context. <clears throat> And if we look at uh, approved increases in the overall budget, so that's the net patient revenue and plus the fixed perspective payments, uh, we can see the 8.6 there uh, was the guidance value. And we see, you know, uh, some hospitals are below that, uh, some are above it. Uh, but we see that in most cases, the request is higher than we have seen in the past six years. And uh, here are some nice slides of numbers. Uh, this is showing uh, the budget to budget increases. So from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 23. But I think quite notably, we see that we are also displaying the change from the projections in uh, for 22 versus the budget. And we'll see that quite a few hospitals are quite above their 22 budget. 22 budgets were very difficult to make just because of all the uncertainty. So I'm not surprised that they are off, but I think that it's gonna be really important as we evaluate these asks that we also consider what that projection to budgetary ask is as well. So if you um, look at some of these, the number in the third column is quite a bit different than the number in the first column. Um, and finally, we can see the compounding growth rate from fiscal year 20 to date. So overall, our PPS hospitals are growing at 6% average growth, annual growth rate, and the critical access hospitals at 6.3, um, overall 6.1. <clears throat> And here are the numbers that back up our calculations on the previous slide, if anyone wants to check our math. <clears throat> And here we have uh, the payer mix. So this um, is going to be um, an imprecise science for anyone. Uh, so uh, a fun fact is that a lot of the revenue doesn't actually tra track the individual. <laughs> so we do our best to estimate this by payer, but even the same hospital system might not track these funds uh, exactly the same way. But on average, we're seeing uh, you know about half of the case mix being in commercial over the past few years. We do see a projected jump uh, in the fiscal year 23 budget up to 57%. Um, one thing I definitely want to make sure is that we're all booking that Medicare Advantage business the same way that I just want to make sure that's true apples to apples increase. Um, but also part of that is going to be expectations that people move from being covered by Medicaid to a QHP. Um, and we see that the case mix does look quite a bit different for our PPS hospitals as compared to our critical access hospitals by design. So uh, they tend to have a higher proportion of Medicare people, um, uh, patients that they're taking care of. So we see that um, the commercial uh, population is relatively 
uh, higher in our uh, prospective payment hospitals, our bigger hospitals. And when we look at our um, fixed perspective payment as a proportion of the NPR and fixed perspective payments, uh, we'll see that it's been uh, relatively stable since uh, fiscal year 21. We haven't seen any major increases in this. I will note uh, that we will be polling the hospitals um, to hear, learn if they are planning to continue to receive the all-inclusive population-based payment from Medicare. Um, we want to remember that that is more a cash flow mechanism than anything else because those payments are ultimately reconciled to the fee-for-service equivalent. And so some hospitals uh, may not choose to continue receiving that. So that proportion might change, um, even though nothing would be different about the dollars at risk or anything else about that. It's, it's just really changing the cash flow. And here we see uh, the proportions in numbers that back up the graphs that we just presented. <clears throat> so other operating revenue, well, one story here is that uh, if you look on the left hand chart, uh, we see that lighter blue cap on the uh, other operating revenue. That's our COVID relief funding uh, that is really uh, drying up. Uh, there's not expected to be much more there. You can see that that was a really helpful um, mechanism to help make hospitals whole um, during the past few years. Um, and also we see the um, relative proportion of the specialty pharmacy and uh, how much that's contributing to the revenue. So here's the other operating revenue in numbers again, just in case you want to check our map. <laughs> and their operating expenses. Um, but what was helpful for me to break this down is to kind of look at the major buckets of expenses and how they've changed. And um, the way to read this is there's an expense category on the far left. So the first one is wages and compensation. So if you look at um, the budgeted change from 21 actual to the 22 budget, it was 3%. But if you compare the 21 actual to the 22 projection, so what's actually happening this year, you'll see there's actually an 11% increase. So that goes to some of those unbudgeted increases in having to pay for travelers and um, increasing salaries that weren't necessarily budgeted. And when we look at the change from the 22 projection to the 23 budget, it's a 4% increase instead of the 14% um, from the 21 actuals. So just trying to put some of these expenses into context. So they look like, um, I think, bigger increases from actual to the 23 budget than it seems like they are along the way. We are going to um, you know, keep an eye on those projections because they, they can continue to evolve as we get more information. But I think that they're giving us a better signal than the 22 budget at this point. Uh, you know, makes sense. You've got more information. So similarly, pharmaceuticals uh, from the 21 um, actual to the 22 budget was uh, projected to increase by 1%. But in the uh, 22 to date, we're seeing more of a 20% increase, um, which is expected to basically um, be another 18% on top of that into fiscal year 23. So that's another major driver of uh, expenses in the system. Um, so supplies are one that, uh, you know, are also increasing. So we actually ex were expecting to see a slight decrease in the 22 budget from the um, 21 actual, but it ended up being a 2% uh, increase to date uh, with expenses budgeted uh, to increase by another 4% into fiscal year 23. And travelers, that's the one that um, really stands out. So um, negative 62% is what was budgeted uh, compared to the actual, but it actually increased by 58%. Uh, we are seeing those costs starting to stabilize and come down a little bit. So if we look at the 22 project projection compared to the 23 budget, we're seeing another decline of 36%. So um, we're hoping to see that uh, <laughs> some of those efforts to retain staff are actually successful. Uh, and then just overall, similarly, um, the budgeted increase of 3% is looking more like 11%. And uh, to the year over year from the projection to the budget at 4%. So some of these costs are definitely midstream and are going to be relatively less dramatic from the 22 projection to the 23 budget. 
Um, and so this uh, this shows that even with those uh, projections to date, we're still uh, expecting a system wide shortfall um, in operating revenue as compared to the expenses. Um, and again, that uh, COVID funding uh, that was helping fill that gap is is not expected to continue. So that's a kind of critical component in trying to tackle these 23 requests. Um, so. Red is not great when you see a negative operating margin. Um, notably, we see some of our largest hospitals in the red here. So um, the University of Vermont Medical Center is uh, at negative 2.5, Rutland at negative 3.8%, um, Central Vermont at negative 5%. So um, these are some large providers and seeing those operating margins um, being projected to be in the red um, is a concern. Um, in dollars, you can see that, you know, uh, yeah, that the, there's a lot of zeros in red, unfortunately, at the moment. And when we put this into context, looking back to fiscal year 18, um, we typically show our, our all our hospitals, how just our largest hospital looks and then what the rest of the system looks like without that large hospital. And here we can see that, um, you know, UVM's loss is kind of pulling the system down a little bit, um, but that uh, there is consistency in the budgets uh, for a 2% operating margin, which I think is consistent with past decisions. Um, and here we see our total margins, um, also uh, a lot of red, seeing some pretty high negative numbers. Um, so as, as far as how these kind of financial metrics, a lot of these pressures are not unique to Vermont. Uh, they're not, you know, <laughs> by any means. So we want to just provide as much context as we can to you in these difficult decisions. And so some things that we're um, getting for that is uh, we are seeking uh, help from some of the state's expert economists to get their take on the near-term forecast for medical cost inflation, um, with a particular emphasis on the um, that inflation that is really outside the control of the Green Mountain Care Board or any state actors. Uh, we are looking at the price um, increase for qualified health plans in the publicly available filings through HIOS. Um, we would love to see what negotiated prices hospitals are getting in the competitive market, but unfortunately, a lot of that is not um, available. It's uh, proprietary negotiations or confidential negotiations. So unfortunately, the, this is kind of the best we can do to get a sense of that. And then we're also trying to build out on some comparative workforce information, um, starting with the Medicare cost reports. Again, just to add context um, for Vermont. Uh, so I'm going to walk through um, some previous key financial metrics uh, that we, the board has looked at in the past. One caution before we get started is that the most recently available metrics are for 2020, calendar year 2020, which is obviously not an ideal comparison point for anything, um, but it's, again, the most recent we have. And here's where I'll put a plug for um, while relative information is, is super helpful, also having some kind of guidelines for what we um, would like to codify for financial health, I think would be a good opportunity for improvement in the future. Um, so here uh, we'll start with those operating margins. Um, so we have separated our critical access hospitals and our PPS hospitals, the larger hospitals. So for those larger hospitals, we're using um, Fitch Solutions uh, for a northern New England and a larger northeast benchmark. We also have our um, average of Vermont hospitals. So we can see that on average, uh, that line is below zero by quite a bit. Um, and we are seeing uh, that, you know, back in, uh, back in, uh, it, it, that was back in 2020, to be clear. <laughs> so we were doing poorer than our Northeast uh, benchmarks back in 2020. Um, and so we also have, uh, for our critical access hospitals, uh, the flex monitoring, we have a Northeast critical access hospital and a US critical access hospital benchmarks. Um, I would say, as you would expect, because of the similarity in how they're paid, uh, the deltas and the cos tends to be tighter um, for these reference benchmarks than it is for the larger hospitals. 
Um, but we'll see, you know, seeing some negatives is is never good on an operating margin. Um, and, you know, not seeing things that look pretty low here. Uh, so if we look at the total margin, um, again, uh, looking at 2020, but we're seeing um, some hospitals, uh, you know, not many hospitals are exceeding kind of the regional benchmarks from 2020, and that's also alarming for our critical access hospitals. Uh, relatively more are kind of above the relative benchmarks on our uh, prospective hospital system on that total margin. These cash on hand, I think that's a really important one to make sure that we're tracking. So um, those uh, were uh, somewhat inflated, I think, by the COVID relief funding. So I think we're starting to see that drop as that's expiring. So um, seeing some of those numbers come down, always want to remind ourselves that um, Southwestern does not include their larger um, company. So um, that number is, is not necessarily one to freak out about right there. <laughs> Um, so days receivable, um, looking a little bit more robust, but um, still seeing, you know, these numbers lower than uh, might be ideal. Days payable, um, again, uh, Vermont average is significantly below the Northeast peers uh, back in 2020, both for the critical access and the PPS hospitals, and we're not seeing um, them catch up uh, for, to 2020 levels here. Um, Long-term debt to capitalization, this is going to look really funky again due to um, having to kind of postpone capital improvements and other projects due to COVID. So this one's going to be maybe one of the hardest ones to interpret out of the box this uh, at this moment. Um, similarly, our, our debt service coverage ratios, this is going to be a really critical um, measure uh, for kind of uh, the ability to borrow um, in to catch up on some of that improvement. So um, still seeing Vermont well below the Northeast averages uh, for 2020. Um, starting to see a little bit more recovery here, but uh, probably more work to do in that area. Um, age of plant is one where, uh, again, that's a little bit um, difficult to interpret at the moment, but uh, we are starting to see some um, certificate of need applications starting to come in for modernization and attaching attacking other um, necessary improvements. Uh, yeah, so those are kind of, sorry to whirlwind you through those, but again, uh, worry about the 2020 comparison. So um, might not be the best place for us to focus this year. Uh, so here's the ACO participation, um, almost everyone in for Medicaid, uh, quite a few people participating in Medicare and the, the commercial business. And we have a couple of participants for the self-funded market as well. Um, this is how it breaks out. Still have mostly governmental payers. Um, and we are expecting a bit of a decline in the Medicaid participation. And that, again, is mostly driven by the redeterminations and the expected continuing decrease in enrollment in Medicaid. All right, that was a lot of talking. So next steps will be the hearings. Uh, so we're going to work on you know, producing you the typical material that you would see your binders, if you will. Um, and we'll start on Monday, August 15th with Southwestern in the morning and Brattleboro in the afternoon. On Wednesday, we're going to get three in, Grace Cottage at the beginning of the day, Springfield uh, mid-morning and Northeastern in the afternoon. Friday the 19th is the UVM Health Network. And the following week, we start with Rutland and Mount Muscutney on Monday. North Country and Gifford on Wednesday and Copley and North. Oh, I'm sorry. That was Northwestern uh, on the 17th and North NBRH on the Friday, the 26th. And uh, again, just for reference, some key indicators. So seeing uh, where these summarized values are um, and a glossary of terms. So uh, that's mostly for posterity. I'm happy to hear any questions, comments that you have to share at this moment. Sarah, great work. And uh, I just want to point out that I think there's a critical piece missing. And um, all these numbers are based on the way a hospital is managed currently. And, uh, you know, we've all seen where um, 
in the non-medical world where one business has failed in a location, but someone else has been able to operate it differently and um, be successful. And I thought that uh, there was a lot of very useful benchmarking um, numbers that were sent in in a, a public comment. And it's something that uh, we don't necessarily look at, but um, like productivity measures, like um, the performance, the, the number of uh, patients per um, employees, things like that. And um, I just think that uh, my biggest fear is that if rates are approved in Vermont, both for hospitals and for insurers that are too high, that you're going to drive up um, bad debt. You're going to force Vermonters to make decisions that they shouldn't seek care, and that may cost more in the long run. And I just look at this as a, a recipe for disaster with the same uh, knowledge that we need to make sure we have healthy hospitals. So that that's my comment. I just think that there's a piece missing. Other board members? Any comments or questions? I don't have any comments or questions at this time. I know we've got a lot to dig into, and Sarah, I appreciate this this big overview. Um, I'm looking forward to all the binders and digging into all the narratives and trying to understand and unpack all that you know lies beneath. So thank you, though. I don't have any questions or comments at this time. So Sarah, one one question, one area I have a question on um, is Medicaid. I um, my own personal view, but as I go back through the Joint Fiscal Office's record on Medicaid um, and its contribution, it's basically been flatlined for the last five years. Uh, in some ways, for reasonable reasons, uh, caseloads go up during the pandemic and then they come down, so you expect some volatility there. But um, um, recently, we just got the notice that the uh, 1115 waiver has been signed. Um, and uh, with the old waiver, and I'm sure uh, for the new one, there is a, a spending neutrality cap. Um, and I guess I'd like to know um, in this process where Vermont stands relative to the spending neutrality camp, because um, that would be a spending neutrality cap, because that would uh, give us an indication as to whether or not our reimbursement rates are where they could be. I mean, maybe they are perfectly structured, maybe they're not, but uh, uh, Medicaid is one of the major partners and, and it would be good to know um, exactly how that uh, 1115 uh, waiver is working. Yeah, I, I definitely don't think I can speak for our colleagues, but I think that they um, are also critically concerned about the stability of our health care providers and it might be worth um, inviting them in to talk to you about their perspective on this, um, especially in the near term. Another another area that, and I've raised this concern, I don't know, and concurring opinions or dissenting opinions, I forget, probably in both. Um, but uh, is the is the level of growth of fixed perspective payments. Uh, I understand, um, you know, there's there's change in Medicare that's happening. Um, uh, I still see little, if any, growth uh, in the uh, with commercial payers, and I'm just wondering, you know, I mean, there's uh, there's a lot to be done out there, I'm sure, at the hospital levels, but do you get a sense uh, whether or not, um, uh, you know, hospitals are uh, seeking, actively seeking to grow their fixed perspective payment uh, component or whether or not it's something that's on the a, a back burner until they address other issues like travelers and pharmaceuticals and some of the other major drivers. 
Gosh, um, I think I'm going to owe you some homework here where I can kind of distill um, how that was addressed in the narratives. Uh, we can consolidate that for you. Um, and if there are follow up questions, we can certainly help uh, broker those. If no other board member has any comments or questions, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment at this time? Uh, Kevin, this is Mike Del Treco. I, I'm ha having a hard time raising my hand, but yes, okay, I do. Mike, I'll call on you first. Go ahead. Uh, I apologize that for that. I was trying to uh, to uh, raise my hand. The computer wouldn't allow me to. So, um, uh, so certainly these are. Um, trying times. Uh, there's a lot of Vermonters that are um, having difficulties paying their bills and we we at the at the hospitals recognize that. Um, however, I do want to start my comments with some accomplishments. I, I don't think we recognize them enough and, and I think it's important to. Um, first, all of our hospitals participate in value based models. Um, this is this really demonstrates our commitment to progress, affordability, and the patients we care for. Um, if you look around, there's very little, very little or no other states doing the work we're doing in this space. Um, we have significantly bent our cost curve um, from the inception of the Green Mountain Care Board. We've re reduced our growth rate, our net revenue or an FPP growth rate um, by almost four um, percent. I know that. This doesn't always feel like it saved anybody money or affected premiums, but this is real money and it adds up. To provide some context, if we had grown at the, about the 8% prior to the Green Mountain Care Board, we would have a spend or a growth rate of $2 billion higher. Um, we led and we continue to lead one of the best and most aggressive campaigns against COVID-19. There, there's certainly a cost to that, but it's been a, a, a really important part of um, how Vermonters have uh, have have survived and, and managed this pandemic. Um, we've been very innovative. We recognize many needs in our communities, and we've expanded our definition of a hospital well beyond bricks and mortar. Um, you may have read my column this week, but it addresses things like housing, food insecurities, transportation, um, and it's all around how do we build and and have um, vitality within the communities. Um, and vitality is econ economic vitality as well as um, healthier communities. Um, one thing that we uh, also don't talk about is we have a 98% uninsured rate. Um, clearly there's some underinsured, um, but we have a population that has 90% insured. That comes with a cost. Um, and, and we really need to, to understand that. The list goes on, um, but unfortunately on the other side of the story, um, there's a group of hospitals that require your help and assistance at this time. We have 10 hospitals, uh, more than 10 hospitals um, with negative margins for 22, and without um, other operating revenues, our, our delivery system would, would be decimated. When you add on top of that or consider it violence in the workplace, workplace pressures uh, related to workforce and, um, and shortages of, of nurses uh, uh, and, and through the entire delivery system um, to help to to cafeteria workers and 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 uh, other other areas of the business. It's a, a very big problem. We have, as uh, Sarah mentioned, we have um, very high traveler expenses at this time. Um, then you lay on unprecedented inflation in other areas, our deferred capital maintenance. Um, you might even look at look at this picture and say, how, how are we even providing the services that we're doing and, and surviving in this moment? Um, furthermore, our hospitals deliver, deliver care in a system that doesn't have appropriate resources for mental health and long-term care patients. And to make matters worse, those delivery systems are stressed as well. Not only is this the most expensive way to care for people, but more importantly, it's the worst place and, and it's the worst way to care for these people. Uh, they deserve better. Um, during any given week, our hospitals, um, some of our hospitals at our 100% capacity, 
a real channel challenging situation and um, scary at times. Um, as far as our rates go, I think we need to be careful not to perpetuate the idea that our hospital increases represent a dollar for dollar increase in premiums. We know this is not how it works. We know that insurers don't pay that way. And we know that there are other uh, variables such as volume and acuity into this equation. So there's a lot here, a lot of good, a lot of challenge. Um, I can tell you that my, my discussions with the VAS leadership, um, we are committed to this work, but in this moment, we need your help. Um, and I ask that that you you when you go through this process that you approve these budgets as they've been submitted. Thank you for your time and I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Next, I'm going to call on Walter Carpenter. Walter. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, you said what I had on my mind, so I won't reiterate it. Um, as to Michael's comment about 98% uninsured, we should not forget that 44% or so of those Vermonters are underinsured. And if they do go to one of the hospitals at either these rates or older rates, there's something called medical debt that will be facing them. Um, the only thing I can say is listening to all of this and the questions and Michael's comments and stuff is that Bill Schubert had a piece in the Vermont Digger called Time to Rethink Vermont's Healthcare System. And I think we are at that time. We have to start rethinking it, or this is just going to keep going on and on and on. Uh, Kevin is right that Vermonters will not be able to access care anymore because it's going to be simply too expensive. And access has always been the problem of access because of cost has always been the major problem of this health system that we have been unable to solve with a market-based form of health care like we have now. It's time to rethink our health care system. I yield the floor. Thank you, Walter. Next, I'm going to go to Hamilton Davis. Ham? Hey, uh, thank you, Kevin. I'm not sure whether it's a technical thing, but I couldn't see the slides that, that uh, that Sarah was showing. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure where they are, but I'd like to know how we get full access to all of her slides so that we can see the numbers. Maybe, maybe the okay. members could see, but I, I couldn't see them here. Maybe I'm the only one. We could see them, and sometimes um, if there's low um, uh, bandwidth that, in a location, you don't get uh, um, somebody's video or their slides. Like, for example, in a number of meetings, um, other people have seen people that I, I didn't see. So um, I think it's really uh, a bandwidth issue, uh, Ham, um, because they were uh, pretty clear to uh, most of us, at least. Would it be, but would you Sarah, can you um, post those to the website so that Ham can uh, access those and, and uh, email him a link? Already drafting it. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Kevin, th thank you and Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, really thanks, Sarah. She's doing all the work, Am. <laughs> yeah, I need somebody else to do a lot of the work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Mike Del Treco, your hand is up. <laughs> well, I figured it out. Uh, one thing I did want to say um, to Sarah, and I and I omitted. Sarah, I know you have a brand new team um, and I know you're working hard on all this and I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thanks, Mike. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? Hearing none. Is there any follow up from the board? Hearing none, Sarah, thank you and your team. And uh, I'm sure we'll be asking you a lot of questions. So thank you. And uh, um, this is a trying time. It's tough to be on the Green Mountain Care Board in the summer. <laughs> um, is there any old business to come before the board? 
Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank you, Tom. For a minute, I didn't think anybody wanted to leave. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.